And now we are coming to non-immigration visas. And um, um, let me introduce uh, Simon Gladin. Uh, he's uh, one of the best experts in uh, uh, O1 uh, whom I know. Um, and uh, we'll be happy to hear your speech, Simon. Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you, Michael, to my colleague, Michael. I just happen to be Simon Michael Gladden. So I too am a Michael of sorts. Um, and I wanted to thank Michael for discussing the topic of denials. You know, one thing I, I love cake, I love cookies and dough, but topic of denial was tough and I you aced it. And I, my opinion, you just basically shared, I share my opinion with you. I think sometimes you need to appeal, but most of the time it's just more prudent to. Um, to refile, address what the officer disliked and refile. So I'm going to share my screen. I prepared a little, um, where is it? I prepared a little presentation on the subject. Um, can you guys see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's amazing. Okay, very cool. So that's just an introduction. Um, so there's basically a visa not for, for every letter of alphabet. Uh, but however, to be a little more concise, I would, I would um, offer that we speak only about four of them. We should really speak about three because as of half an hour ago, one of them has become completely irrelevant for the next year. And that's the H-1B visa that is probably or should probably be the most used by most professionals or all professionals. Um, however, it's absence because there's 65,000 visas available to everyday folk and um, 20,000 more available to graduates of US uh, magistrate or master's programs. Uh, because of that, it's a very coveted visa. Uh, everybody likes it. However, O1 has become sort of its replacement, although unduly so. It really is visa. But you would consider for people, you know, for, for big artists. And some time ago when I started in this field, which was in the late 90s, uh, I was a paralegal for one of the greatest immigration minds uh, uh, at Baker McKenzie. Uh, all one was basically unheard of. The all ones you would prepare would be for the likes of, I don't know, um, Maestro Enio Maricón. It was one that I used, that I actually worked on. And that was the sort of the, 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 the format, that was the uh, caliber. So the H-1 was the visa where you basically have to uh, be offered a professional job, or as they call it, the specialty occupation position. Uh, and that is roughly translated to, in order to qualify for it, you should be offered a, um, a, a job that requires at the very least a bachelor's degree. And you should also have a bachelor's degree in the relevant field. Uh, that's really all there is to it there are different things that you can potentially do in order to qualify for an H if you don't have a degree but that's sort of that that's an old separate conversation um so i had said that i had said that so you have to have a u.s petitioning employer uh you have to be offered a job and you have to be um, you have to have a degree for it you also have to file a document with the department of labor that basically says that you will be treated just as any normal U.S. worker would. So this job, the, the, this petition cannot be filed in order to fill a position that's been, you know, for, from which a U.S. Uh, employee has been basically fired. Okay, so that brings us to this se se separate uh, visa, to another visa, it's E2. It's a visa that's given to treaty investors or treat E1s are given to uh, treaty traders. I prefer the E2s when possible. Uh, because the treaty tradesman requires you to have a company that's already engaged in international trade. And uh, if you're trading internationally, you have to show that at least half of this trade is between your country and the United States. So E2 visa roughly works in the same in, in, in a very simple way when it's available to you. Uh, it is available only to citizens of certain countries that have uh, that have treaties of finance, uh, treaty of commerce and navigation with the United States. Uh, for example, of the former Soviet republics, uh, Russia and Belarus do not have it. Uh, it is available to citizens of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Armenia, Georgia, uh, all the Baltic states. But I, th I think that that's about uh, Moldova as well. So the, and it works rather simple. You have to have a plan. 
for a business enterprise in the United States. And you have to be able to show that you have sufficient capital that you have made legally uh, in order to make this plan work. And so with that, you basically prepare an application, uh, unlike many other petitions within the US, uh, within the immigration realm, it is filed directly with a consulate if you're overseas. You can also change the status if you're in the United States, but the, the, one of the advantages of this visa is that you prepare it and you file it directly with the consulate. The consular officer meets with you, uh, discusses the strategies uh, that you intend to pursue in the United States and if approved, you're allowed to come to the United States and start your own business. Um, not only can the investor himself come and work for this company, but a, people from the same country can also come and work for this company in uh, executive, supervisory, or specialized knowledge uh, positions. So basically, a company, if it's 50% uh, or more, they say it has to be owned and controlled uh, by the citizens of the country. So if, say, the citizens of Kazakhstan have organized a company in the United States, they came here themselves in the E2, and they can also invite other citizens of Kazakhstan to work for the same company. So sometimes it's a very good visa for, uh, let's say, consulting companies. So that, that's been done a lot when the companies from certain country would actually come to the US, and they're able to bring not only executives, but some engineers as well. So that, that, that's a wonderful visa if you can get it. Uh, the things to remember about this visa, so the investment needs, we need to be able to show that the investment is made with the money that's been uh, legally made and that the uh, taxes have been paid on it. Um, so sometimes, and it's unfortunately true with many of the uh, countries of the former Soviet Union, where they use this term that I love a lot, um, optimization of taxation. Uh, we're unable to do this because people are unable to show that the money that they have made and put, put aside for this business have been made legally. Uh, there are ways to handle this. Uh, sometimes when, you know, and I don't presume that people made the money illegally, it's just a problem of showing whether, whether or not it's been, you know, legalized. So sometimes it's, it's difficult to show that you have a trail of money where they came from, that the taxes have been paid on them and so forth. So sometimes you can do things like um, take a loan. Uh, the only thing you cannot take a loan uh, or uh, support this loan, you cannot support this loan by the equity of your company in the US. So sometimes people do things like they, um, you know, loan their, or they put their, their the security for their loan could be their um, real estate overseas. So we've done that a lot. Uh, the enterprise also has to be non-marginal and the marginal enterprise is such that is only able to support the livelihood of the uh, investor and his family so either this company has to have a potential to make really good money within the first two to five years or you have to hire other people to work there so thereby more people are being supported by this um, uh, by this enterprise Okay, so that takes us to this another visa. Um, if you guys want, I'll make this uh, presentation available um, so you can read it. There's a lot of fine print on it. Uh, the L1A visa, and that's a visa that's actually, I would say we use, it's probably my second favorite visa nowadays. I'll probably, or rather not mine, but my clients. People uh, often call me uh, with the questions about O1. But this is the second visa that's available to citizens of all countries. If you have a certain intranational uh, or uh, multinational business. So the way that it works is you have to have uh, an office overseas where you work in a managerial or again, a specialized knowledge uh, capacity. You have, you have to have done it for at least one year within the last three years. And then you can either um, so you can either put together a new office in the United States and come manage it, or if this, uh, if this relationship had already existed, you can come and work for the company in the United States already. You don't have to create a new company if the company had already existed. Um, so the, the way that it's handled, if you're coming to work for a new office, uh, you could get a visa for uh, one year. And in one year, you have to show to the USCIS that your business is well if not thriving then it's, it's already operational 
and that you already are a manager and executive in the U.S. company as well. Uh, and then they will extend it for three more uh, periods of two years each, so for the maximum of seven years. If you're coming to work in an L1B uh, classification, uh, which is a professional employee with specialized knowledge, uh, you can only get it for five years. So um, the things to remember, so what you have to have is you have to have a U.S. employer, and it has to have, it really doesn't, it says four different forms of um, a relationship with an overseas office. So uh, the one, either one company is a parent company of, other, of the other. So either the US company owns 50% or more of the overseas company or the overseas company owns 50% or more of the US company. Uh, a branch uh, is uh, basically, it's a very difficult or rather not difficult. It's a very unusual setup. Uh, because you'd normally open an office in the United States. So some, some countries allow this. Some countries allow, for example, in Spain, a, another company can just, a company from overseas can, in Spain, open its own office without incorporating. It's a very unusual setup, but sometimes it happens. I wouldn't know why a company would do that in the United States, but it, it happens sometimes. So a subsidiary is basically, um, it, it's the, it's the uh, flip of the parent company. And the affiliate is basically the same idea, but when two companies are owned by uh, a third company, so more or less like a holding scenario. Uh, sometimes it doesn't have to, it could be the same person, uh, but more often than not, you'll see that it's the legal entities. Uh, so an employee has to, as I said, has to come, come work here in an executive or managerial capacity uh, and a specialized knowledge. I try to speak very little of it normally because it's probably one of the most difficult uh, visas to get to prove to someone, prove to the government that you're coming to the United States because you cannot be um, replaced by a by a U.S. worker is very difficult. Uh, sometimes you would probably have to. So on average, if you were to write a supporting letter explaining why someone is so specialized that he needs to be transferred to the U.S., um, a roughly a 14 page description, 14, 15 page description of your job duties would be in order. And that's something that's just usually it's very tough. Uh, and that finally brings us to my favorite visa, or rather the favorite visa of those who participate in Nikita's uh, Telegram channel, which is very, very educational. Um, it's the visa that's given to people that have extraordinary abilities in uh, business, arts, science, sports, or academics. Uh, in order for you to qualify for it, you have to prove that you are one of the few people, few top percent of the people working in your profession. Uh, and then I actually underscore that you're one of the small percentage of those who have, are risen to the very top of the field. Uh, so you have to prove three of the eight criteria in order, in order to qualify for it. Or rather, they say you have to have won a major national or international prize, such as the Nobel Prize. But thankfully, they put the semicolon after that and say, or you must prove that you have three of the following eight criteria in order to qualify. I uh, wrote this criteria in a slightly different order that it's done uh, by the USCIS. The, US, the, the government uh, in, in its regulatory acts have put these in a slightly different um, order. I, however, use it in such order that I find these criteria the most flexible beginning with the one that is probably the most flexible and it is a uh, you have to prove that you are employed in a critical or essential capacity for an organization or establishment that has distinguished reputation so basically we can look in the uh, most people that want to get in a one or most people that want to come to the united states come here for a reason and they don't necessarily get out of school and immediately become extraordinary. They have done something in their life that they can be proud of. And that's why I believe that the employment in critical or essential capacity is applicable to most of you guys. So for, for, for most of you, you have done something great in your life where before you decide to come to the United States and we can brag about it. So we have to show two things. First, that the company that you work for has distinguished reputation. And it's either done by showing, uh, you know, a press interest in it, or that the company has won some some prizes, some awards, or maybe we can prove it by showing letters, recommendation letters from those clients that it had worked for, uh, that say that the company doesn't have distinguished reputation. 
And the second thing we have to show that your role within the company was essential. Uh, and that's usually done, not usually, but that's the best way to do this is to get a letter from your previous employer that would describe why uh, your role in the company was absolutely crucial to it. Um, the second criterion is proof of participation on a panel, on the panel or individually as a judge of work of others. I say this because, well, you know, we are hosted by the by the Burning Heroes, and it, they, you guys have put together a very interesting um, competition, and, and it's certainly something that very much works. So there are competitions abound that you can join and be the judge of. Uh, the only thing to avoid probably is putting together, if you're applying for an one is putting together the um, competition yourself. So our idea is to show that people think of you as an expert in the field and that they ask you to come join some panel because you are an exceptional individual. Um, the other things that we had certainly uh, used here, for example, things like sometimes we would use a letter from um, a, a from a VC, for example, who would write to us that he uses expertise of our O1 uh, beneficiary in order to show, um, you know, so, so basically, if you can imagine a VC is asked for money, he doesn't know much about the field. So he needs to rely on the opinion of an expert in the field. And if he invites you as such an expert and can show us that he can write us a letter about it, that also works. Uh, then there are three that are less but, well, these three criteria, they're basically, they require more effort. And if they're not in your portfolio yet, these things will require an effort. So it's a membership and I call it an elite association. Uh, the word association should really be used very liberally. It doesn't necessarily mean that that should be a, an organization that's already been registered with the government that has its bylaws and somehow this is an, this is an association that, you know, puts out its its rules and, and how to become a member of it. Sometimes we use things like work on the expert panel or in a um, mentor panel for an accelerator. So like a startup accelerator, they have uh, a certain number of people uh, that they invite to mentor the uh, startup founders. And if we can get a letter from an accelerator that says, well, we are very selective in, in finding whom we want to work for us as a mentor, then we can um, use that letter and show that you are a member of an association. Uh, we've also previously used, I don't like using it so much anymore, but sometimes we, we would, uh, letters from like elite accelerators where the, um, where the start, your own startup have gone through. So sometimes we've used it previously for places like 500 startups, and we've used it with people from the, um, what's that great, the, the y, y Combinator, um, some other ones, uh, the government, you know, sometimes as Michael was pointing out, uh, they have this wonderful thing called their request for evidence, which they often send to you. And much like the denial, it has in it um, a reasons why they put together reasons why they don't believe you'd qualify for it. And sometimes in the RFEs I had seen where they say things like, well, being a member of an accelerator isn't really a big accomplishment besides it's your company and not you. There's still arguments to be made about it, but uh, other, way, other ways to satisfy this requirement may be actually being a member of an association that on its face is not very glamorous, but within that association, you could be on a certain panel that, that elects people. For example, we had someone who was uh, a member of IEEE in Russia, which was called slight, slight, something slightly different. But within that organization, he was on a committee that uh, presided over like what sort of education is needed to be an electrical engineer, what sort of education is needed elsewhere. So we were able to make an argument that because uh, to get on that committee, you had to have had um, a, certain, a vote by others that it qualified as such an elite association. Then the two uh, following, the, the two following criteria are basically a mirror image of one another. Uh, you have to show that you have published papers uh, and the materials that, that you authored and that you published them in uh, magazines that have either scientific magazines, if you were a scientist or were a scientist before becoming a, an entrepreneur, for example, or if you are an entrepreneur and you've published in, um, in such 
but it's not necessarily scientific publications, but not, not, not specifically scientific media, but maybe it's business related media. So the Forbes of this world, uh, you know, they, they certainly work and they, they, there's, there's a balance to be had. So sometimes people ask me, well, should I publish it there or should I not? Should, should, should I waste the time on writing these articles? It's a question that I can't really answer very often because it's really, you need to look into how difficult it is to you for you to write and how many people would actually be interested in hearing what you have to say. Uh, and a mirror even image of it is there are published materials in the very same uh, professional or major trade journals about you and your work. Very often people rely on articles written about your company. That's not necessarily helpful. Uh, so these need to be at the very least mention you by name. Um, so the companies, articles about the companies are great for the first uh, criterion where we argue that you had worked for companies that have distinguished reputation, but in this it has to be about you and your work. And then following the last three criterion, which I don't very often, well, I mean, we use them all the time, which don't necessarily rely on them. Uh, specifically, the contribution of major significance in the field. You never really know what that means, and I honestly don't. But sometimes the things that we would post here uh, would be patents that a person had authored and had licensed to another company, for example. And it backfires at times. So I had someone who had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, like 35, he, he co authored 35 patents that we've submitted as evidence of contribution major significance. And the government came back to saying in an RFE, we won't after afterwards, but in an RFE, it says, well, in itself, it doesn't really say much about him. And we've argued otherwise, and we want that there were other criteria. Um, then there's the evidence of high salary remuneration. So basically, you get paid well. The government had applied a very improper standard to it. And at least two RFEs that I had seen, they wrote back to us saying, well, it's fine that they've done so well in the past, but please show to us that the person will be getting paid you know more than more than normally in the united states this isn't how the regulations are written so we've successfully argued back uh, the way to prove this is to basically show your say your tax information your your tax re returns and then show um, some sort of a statistical study that shows what people in your profession would normally get paid and the last one is the evidence of the receipt of nationally internationally recognized prizes, which are lesser than Nobel Prize. Uh, also, it's very difficult because for the entrepreneurs, not many uh, competitions are held. However, you know, we would certainly consider everything. One of my favorite things to do in this, however, uh, USS used to have on its website uh, an explanation of what could be used to satisfy various um, various criteria of all one they've taken it down since however you know the web archives that have kept this and in it it says if you can show that a vc gave your company a certain grant or, or a certain investment and we can prove that it's given to you because you have done you as a founder have done something um, something great they can actually be considered a prize or award I think that pretty much completes. Michael said that we should probably also talk about the P1 visa. Um, P1 visas are available either to extraordinary athletes or it's also available to international groups coming here, musicians, entertainers coming to here to work, um, to, to basically put out concert. The uh, P1 visa is great. I've done many of them in my life. Uh, the, the one thing that, that all ones probably more beneficial, it's very similar to all one. The one thing that the old one's better at is if you mostly come to the United States to train and not so much, um, you know, if you're an athlete, if you come in here to train, but not so much perform because your competitions held elsewhere, you'd probably get an old one. So the old one is maybe slightly more difficult to get, but it is a little more um, like it corporates more. It allows you to do more. So that's my uh, speech as I prepared it. We have about five minutes and I'm hoping you guys have things to ask. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, guys, do you have any questions? You can ask it personally or write it down on the chat. Uh, if you're thinking about the question, so I'm going to ask myself. Uh, so what's your suggest? Um, 
for uh, people who, who open up a company, which mm -hmm. way you suggest? Like O1 visa, more like uh, L1 or uh, EB1 to come to the States and doing a business? Well, I mean, that very much depends on what it is that you're, you're planning to do. So if you're, and again, visas like if you're from a country that allows you to have an E2 visa, uh, which, you know, could, could, there are many, you could probably go online, you not probably, but you could go online to the Department of State's website and see all visas available for your particular country. Um, so the E2 is probably the quickest to get if you can get it. Uh, the L1 is good when you're being transferred from a company overseas to the company in the US. So not a lot of companies are there. Um, you know, some startups don't really have presence in their own country. So many times I've spoken to people that had worked for a company to have a startup. And then they said, well, you know, what about what do you do at home? But they're like, well, no, we'll, we registered the company in Delaware. And that's all we, we're doing it from overseas. We're working there from overseas. So L1 wouldn't be available to them. If you can get an L1, that's a great solution. Uh, if you can, you know, but you do need to either, as uh, Nikita was saying, you do really need to invest time. Well, not the money is it's not really a subject, but you do need to invest time in it. I believe that even if you don't have an L1 case, Today, there's nothing stopping a, you know, a truly exceptional person from putting together a case within six to 12 months pretty easily. But otherwise, you probably aren't very exceptional in Indy. Um, and EB1, of course, is a great, you know, Michael had spoken about them. And if, if you can get it, uh, and the O1 is probably a little easier to get than EB11, which is its green card version. But a lot of people do qualify for it. And, you know, all one doesn't guarantee, but it's probably a good you know, testing stone so to see if you'd qualify for it or not. Sure, thanks a lot. And um, I've heard a lot of time uh, about like an income mm -hmm. uh, question. Like, uh, so like, is there any official uh, amount of the money you should earn per, per, per year uh, while you're like uh, on an all one visa? Or probably. it's not, uh, no? And that, no, and I recommend not, you know, unless, unless you, tr if you're a startup or you probably has a very defined, uh, you know, budget to work with, uh, I always say, don't promise too much, rather, pro it's always okay to pay more than you said, it's never okay to pay less. And so, you know, unless it's true, unless you're invited to work for a company that is prepared to pay you hundreds of thousands of dollars, I don't believe that. In, no, but that for, for example, like you, you earning like I don't know, like thirty thousand. Mm -hmm. I've heard about like a sixty. Uh, so it's. I usually use sixty would be the number I, I would normally recommend. Although it's not discussed anywhere, there's no requirement for you to be, be, get paid that much. I think it's just a kind of a. So wait, do you know any 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 cases that the like the UCIS after all when you apply for a EB one after O one or when you prolong O one ask you like you extraordinary guy and you earning only like a thirty thousand per year like what's happening? It's you know it's a startup that you found you you're about to run it. If you get paid in equity, that's also fine. I had never once uh, had a case. Uh, return to me or any additional information be requested for a case where the money was a subject so no is it so, possible that the government you know, can come back how, and say how like everybody and you also mentioned like 60 thousand uh 60k uh come up like what it stands for is it like in all honesty i don't know it's just kind of a rounded number that that i recommended in, in, but there's no requirement for it there's absolutely no requirement that you get paid uh you can get paid in equity because you're a startup uh, founder Mm, I see. Okay, guys, uh, do you have any question to Simon? If uh, we are done, Simon, thanks a lot for Thank uh, you very much. Time. Nice to see you in person.